today I'll be talking about uh, data analytics and um, how I use it in uh, you know uh, solving a lot of problems. When I exited the uh, academics, I was a very science and tech guy, very much a science and tech guy. Everything to me uh, could be solved by computers, uh, electronics, and everything of that sort. It was very helpful. I'm not saying that it's not, but I learned so many things afterwards and. Uh, uh, now I think a little bit holistic on in which science and tech forms a small uh, section. So anyways, uh, most of the, my work will be covered within urban development, water resources, transport and environment. Uh, we are actually a research to policy uh, uh, tank, you can say. It's both a think tank as well as a do tank. What we do is we do a lot of research and we take it to the government and we try to convert it into a policy or, you know, based on insights that come from that. So this is uh, the vision for my team, which is very simple. Governments, uh, you know, uh, and people make planning and governance decisions based on, you know, a lot of data and everything. So evidence-based planning and management. These are the 17 sustainable development goals. For our economy, when we talk about development, the usual, uh, you know, measure is uh, GDP growth, right? Like, so GDP growth is normally the uh, measure that we use that, you know, 5%, 6% growth, et cetera, et cetera. A sustainable development goal merges that economic development with a lot of other human related development that is critical, right? Like, so it is not about just money generation, but it is about how as a person, how you have been living and your standards of living and everything around that, right? Like, so we cannot boast of 8% growth while, you know, we have so many people who are deprived of uh, you know, basic uh, amenities and uh, access to utilities and services. So uh, from that perspective, there are these 17 goals. The first one is on, you know, no poverty. Second is zero hunger. Third is good health and well-being. Fourth is uh, quality education. Fifth is gender equality. Some way fifth and tenth will be somewhat related uh, because, uh, you know, they work on inequalities, reduced inequalities. Uh, sixth is clean water. Um, seventh is uh, uh, affordable and clean energy. Eighth is uh, decent work and economic growth. Ninth is industry innovation and uh, <clears throat> infrastructure. Uh, tenth, as I mentioned, inequalities. Uh, so, and reducing it, of course. Uh, eleventh is uh, sustainable cities and uh, communities. Twelfth is responsible uh, consumption and production. Thirteenth is climate action. Fourteenth is life below water. Fifteenth is life on land. I mean, these are not just us, but beyond uh, human. Uh, 16th is peace, justice, and strong institutions, which personally is the thing that I've been, I mean, particularly the uh, institutions part and governance angle is what I have been uh, interested of recently in the last few years. 17th is, uh, you know, partnerships for the goals. To achieve these goals, I use data analytics, right? Like, so I use a lot of data geospatial as well as non-spatial data uh, to make sure that we go through a process which will help in making decisions achieve these. One thing is that SDG compliance is something that uh, everybody is looking at right now uh, because uh, when it comes to funding even actually uh, even when, uh, when money is raised for uh, uh, by companies they do ask like you know are you uh, companies or even for non-profit actually, uh, which goals do you, uh, you know, match into, which goals do you, um, uh, you know, where your work comes into, you know, those kind of things always comes into picture. In Bangalore Climate Action Plan, when we were doing it, one of the things was we want, they wanted a map of encroachments in Bangalore's lakes and water bodies, right? Like, so in water bodies, which are the places where they had built up so that we can resist, uh, you know, flooding and all those things. Now, it is a very straightforward thought. Now, if I had done this 15 years ago, I would have directly mapped it out with the best of the available remote sensing technology, GIS technology and everything and a beautiful map would have been published and it would be ready for processing. Now, but the experiences that we had on ground and through verbally through others as well was that it is not a good mechanism to give out sensitive data just like that. The problem is that the person who is going to be influenced by that, uh, I mean, the moment you say that um, this is the encroachment, the poorest will be the first one to suffer. 
bulldozers will straight go into their houses. Why are they building houses over there? Because we are not having mechanisms for affordable housing inside the city, right? Like so the reason why they are encroaching is not because they want that property to encroach, many of them, but they couldn't afford the things in the city, but they would be the first one to be affected. Uh, one case example actually in Chennai, uh, they did this uh, encroachment clearance drive. Very unfortunately on the next day, uh, I mean this was during the floods and everything. The next day there was a lot of trash that was, uh, you know, that had formed in the uh, river because of the flooding and everything. The people who are going to clean were the people who, whose houses they demolished. Right? Like so they had to work and in fact they worked because there is no means of money for them. So this information actually, so 15 years ago me would have, I would have created this information and just put it out. But now I know the value because of through these interactions, through stakeholder consultations, talking to these people, understanding what it means and uh, so right now that is why uh, now I do not call it as data, I call it as very much like a refined data of what I give. So this kind of, uh, this is one. On the other hand, there will be public uh, request to do something. But then I wear the science hat through my, again through my learning process in the science and technology side and change my decision. So data opening cannot uh, happen on a single night because many of us are not ready to it. So what we talk about is usually stages of it. So stage one, stage two, stage three type of a thing. And uh, as the sensitivity, I mean the first thing is that the least sensitive data has to be opened in the first iteration, followed by a little bit of, uh, you know, a slightly complex one that requires a little bit of reading and everything. And the third one is that once you have matured out of that data set, then you would be ready to, con you know, digest this information. Otherwise what we have, I mean this is coming from a very much a practical learning for us. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, on day one when something gets opened, uh, the first one to jump is usually journalists. And the moment the journalists jump in, it's good actually, it's actually good, it's required. Uh, but the moment the journalists jump in, the way we they jump in is that they did not understand the entire process, they didn't go through the same thing. So what happens is that the first thing they see is that, hey, we found a problem with your government and we'll put it out. I mean, we'll say that oh, drains are this way, that is that way, etc, etc. Now this creates a negative reflection from reaction from the government offices from giving out further data. So it stops the, I mean, this is not the most uh, ideal process, but this is how pragmatically over time period you can open up data. I'll uh, talk about this one particular city in Punjab where I'm actually working with. Um, so the government, uh, the IAS officer quickly wanted all these data sets to be created and, uh, you know, a GIS cell to be created and everything. And I said like, uh, you know, your process is uh, uh, very short and it is not, I mean, your, your government is not ready for this. Uh, you are ready for it at an individual level. The, that IAS officer is ready for, at an individual level, but the government setup is not ready for that at a, you know, at a governance level. So what happens is that, that IAS officer got transferred and the entire thing got derailed. It's nowhere now, right now. So uh, what is the mechanism to, uh, you know, because see, everyone has a, like I said, everyone has a learning curve. Government officers have a learning curve. I mean, a good number of them wouldn't have agreed to your policies. It's good. I mean, it's not bad for them to disagree to you. But if they want you to agree to you, you have to create that platform over time. So that is why we right now, I mean, we want it, but we want it in a staggered manner so that they are ready for it. So this is the very simplistic representation of the work I do. So data. Inf information converted into insights and interpretations so that good decisions come out of it. Now there are so many limitations with this, uh, that is what I focus on the end of it. So a typical process for us will be like, you know, you produce a lot of these maps, methodologies and everything around that, you take it to the government officials, sit with them, uh, create plans and, uh, you know, make it like a 
uh, I mean, teach them how to do it and uh, so many things around it. So this is, uh, this is actually for a master plan for uh, a small satellite town next to Bengaluru. Now, when I talk about this data, how am I using it? These are the three sectors in which we are applying. Now, these are the sectors where a lot of science and technology help is actually required. One is monitoring, second is management and third is planning. Um, now, you, you should have this um, thought process when you are going to decide whatever solutions or whatever, uh, whether it is devices, whether it is uh, data or whether it is any form of problem statement, you have to think about these three things and uh, you know, in which sector are you going to help and you know, uh, for example, we talked about uh, sea level rise, we talked about um, uh, uh, flooding. There is a monitoring angle to it, there is a management angle to it, there is a planning angle to it. So in these three sectors only, I tend to focus on with uh, the work. One of the best ways, uh, I mean best civilian application of maps was for the cholera epidemic in London. Incidentally, the creator is John Snow. His map shows the areas where uh, cholera, you know, number of cholera cases per house and everything. So you can see that, uh, you know, this, the, this is old style map, right? Okay, these are like more like coins stack, means uh, 20 people or something like that in that houses. So what he did was he, you know, based on the mapping, he understood like, you know, this particular pump in the middle could be the cause for the outbreak. And he worked on it, right? Like, so this is what exactly I do with maps. So I provide these uh, maps to create that insight that this pump was the problem. And if you close this pump, then cholera epidemic could be stopped, right? Like, so that was the way it worked. So it is the same way I use it. So I use a lot of things, uh, tools. So personally, I use GIS quite a lot. GIS is geographic information system. That is information, but with locational uh, information. We talk about uh, Mumbai. So which means that, um, you know, more than a uh, 1.6 crore people live within this corporation limit. That is where question is answered, no? It is not just that 1.6 crore people are living, but it's saying where you're living, right? Like, so exactly. So this is a map of Bengaluru showing, you know, job locations actually, how many people are working in that particular location. Each larger the circle, the bigger the, uh, you know, uh, office. And uh, with respect to uh, metro lines, now you can imagine what the problem I'm solving. Uh, how to make jobs accessible to metro. So the point uh, I was making about, uh, you know, how how to use public transport, right? Like, so now I know when an uh, investment has come, how many people will be using it for commute and how to strengthen it, right? Like, so this is the kind of things that I uh, work on. So another is remote sensing, which is uh, satellite images, a lot of satellite images. India is a data deficit country, very clearly put. One thing is that it might not have data about something or it might have data about it, but it is a very poor quality data. Um, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's just pure uh, uh, crime about data, like they manipulated data. So this is what you have. So one of the small ways to bypass it is to use these kind of satellite information, etc., so that you can understand a little bit uh, beyond it. So India is a data deficit country in that environment is where we are operating. That is something that we do. So my primary motive is to create uh, digital twins, right? Like, so it doesn't mean that I have to have an extensive, exhaustive list of all the things. Basically, the, the world has to be in my laptop. That is the concept of it. So if I'm seeing this room, let's say if I'm going to working on, work on a problem about this room, this room's map should be there in my uh, uh, computer along with uh, where the sockets are for power, where the fans are, where the projectors are, AC is, etc, etc, everything about it. Same applies to the entire thing. I happened to work on flooding in Mumbai. First thing I had to create was a topography or the elevation of the city. Now, this is a map that you cannot find anywhere else. Nobody has it. Now, how did we create it? I used only open data. Everything is open data about this. So I used bathymetry data from elsewhere. I used port documents. Port PDF files are actually available in the port websites. The details of the port and everything, area around the port. And then the satellite estimated uh, elevation maps. 
I had the building footprints and I had to correct it. All are available out in the open domain. And now I have like, you know, without building, how does Mumbai look, right? So, and up above the sea as well as below the sea. Why is below the sea required for me? Because one of the biggest problems is that when it rains, if there is high tide, where will the water go? I need to know how much tide will be there. And particularly if there is a storm surge or something of that sort, there, I, I'll show some charts around it. But anyways, so anyway, if anyone has a question about why this is a little bit darker over here, that's because poor taxes dredged area. So they had to dig it so that uh, ships can move inside towards uh, JNPT. This is JNPT. So Jalal Nehru Port Trust. And uh, you know, for ships to access from here, you need a depth, right? So to create that, they dug it. So this is how it is, etc, etc. So this is a basic topography map. See the, before I work on that problem, I'm trying to create a virtual, you know, twin of it. And another thing is, if you, if anyone wants to be interested, see this small thing inside the sea, a small mound like uh, thing, this is the back bay. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, that uh, marine drive and the Malabar Hill. And do you see the small point? This is where the proposal is for to build uh, the statue. So now we can make the sense out of it and how to connect it and everything around it. So if you have that data with you, you can start thinking about that problem or you know whatever it is, whether you agree to it or not, you can have an insight about it. Now this is the same thing with uh, building data applied to it, building along with height. Now back when I created, only government had this data. And I had to modify it manually on elevation because that data was slightly outdated and I had to correct it. Now, there is a build, building footprint data available out. There are, I think, two or three data sets. One from Microsoft, one from Google. You can get the footprints at least. And the height information, there is a separate data set and you can play with it a little bit. It's okay. -ish. I mean, if you are going to run flood model, after two floors, you don't have to worry a little bit, right? Like, so you just need to know where the buildings are, which can block everything. So imagine I have this data. I have the computer. I know flow dynamics uh, related equations. Now, what can I do? Simulate flood for different, different scenarios. So without us facing the flood at the time of flood, I can simulate it. I can understand where it is. And I'll also show some samples. If I change something to the topography or the drains, what will happen to it? Even before implementing on the ground, I can have those uh, insights.